Do, does anyone have any other questions on the homework? That is 12 1, 12 2, 12 3, 12 4, 12 5. Um, at the end of every section, there is a chapter test and a review. Since we're going to have some extra time in this section to review, that would be a good thing to kind of look over. Anything from there is free game, and I might even pull questions from the chapter 12 review and the chapter 12 test that's published in your book, put on your exam. Question? The test is a week from Wednesday. The Wednesday after Easter. The Wednesday after Easter. Um, yes, the Wednesday after Easter. So we still have next Wednesday and then a week from Wednesday. Yeah, we and we do not have class. I probably end up going to just cancel class um, April 3rd instead of having an online class because at that point there's no new lecture. There's just a review. So um, it might be to your benefit to just kind of go to the tutoring center and get one-on-one -on -one support because 12, 1, 12, 2, 12, 3, 12, 4, 12, 5, and 12, 6 would have already been presented then. There's not much to present. And I'll probably even give you guys the pre-test before um, Friday. So I can give you that pre-test and you can go over that. And then I'll give you the answers to the pre-test when you come back on Monday for Easter. And then I'll answer any questions. I'll probably maybe even post them in class or talk about them and say, you know, you can kind of grade your own pre-test and then if we need to, I don't know, let's go back over why did you get that one wrong, what went wrong, and we can talk about that. And then you'll take the test on Wednesday. So even though we're a little ahead, I think it's good because it's 12.6. Um, it'd be nice to spend just a little extra time on 12.6. Um, just it's kind of the application in this section is kind of tying everything together. Um, and it's, it's not as transparent as some of the other sections. You guys have all done mean, median, and mode before. You've dealt with graphs. You've talked about maybe bar graphs and histograms. You might not have made the connection, the difference, on more pie graphs and finding the area, or I mean finding the angle. But you, you've had some exposure to that, and reading graphs and organizing data and sim and link plots, things like that. This, you probably not have exposure to before. So if we can hit it once or twice, um, two or three more times than I normally would, it would be to your benefit. So last time we talked about percentile rank and quartile and box plots and kind of see where the data falls within a range. And today we're going to normalize the data. So we're only ever going to work with normal distributions. So the data has to be normalized. We'll talk about a normal distribution and a standard normal distribution. Um, with normal distribution data, they're going to follow certain rules, and we're going to look at the empirical rule. So a certain percent of the population is going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean and the median. So one of the requirements for normal distribution is the mean and the median have to be the same number. And then we'll know, we'll have the empirical rule breaks up into the first standard deviation, the second standard deviation, and the third standard deviation. We'll learn to how to compute a z-score. So how do I translate that to a z-score? If I talk about running a race and my time is 12 minutes and the median is 11 minutes, I can talk about kind of where I fall in that normal distribution curve. So that corresponds to a z-score, which corresponds to the table. And then we're going to look at that table of z-scores to be able to apply that to find the area underneath the standard normal distribution, which then leads us to say what percent of the population falls within that range. So that's where we're leading up to being able to answer that question. For any normal distribution, what percent of the population is going to fall within a certain range? Normal distributions, um, wide variety of quantities in the real world, like size of individuals in the population, IQ scores, and many others tend to exhibit the same phenomenon in which we see the largest number of values somewhere in the middle 
of the range and the classes further away from the center have smaller values. In fact, it's so common that the fre frequency distribution of this type can be known as a normal distribution. So this is kind of how the data is arranged. If you were to take the height of every person in the world, you would expect the average and the median to be where the most people fall. And then of course there's outliers, but those are smaller amounts. So normal distribution follows this kind of curve. A lot of times students get a little confused to think, you know, you know, you don't want a normal distribution as far as your grade wise, because that means half the class is going to get a C and half the class is going to get something less than a C. So you don't want normal distribution as far as grade goes wise, but most things follow this normal distribution curve where 50% of the population is above the average and 50% is below with the majority of the people in the middle. This is a symmetric bell-shaped distribution. It also depends on how many sample sizes you have. So if I just do the height in this classroom, it's going to be a little more choppier if I do the height of people at OTC versus the height of people in Springfield versus the height of people in Missouri, so forth. So this just kind of gives you an idea of um, sample size increasing with um, your sample space. So as the sample size increases, you expect to get this normal distribution. So the first one is 100, increasing that you get this normal distribution curve. Geometry-wise, we can calculate the area of each one of these because they're sums of rectangles. We can calculate what is the area, whatever the height and width is, we can calculate that. But as we let n go to infinity, we, we apply calculus. We don't have calculus as in our prereq for this course, so that's why we use the table. Some properties of normal distribution, it's bell-shaped. The mean, median, and mode are equal and located at the center of the distribution. Right? Mean, median, mode have to be all of three the same, and it's the center. Median is the center, but so, so data that doesn't follow this, data that doesn't have the same mean, median, and mode is not normally distributed. Okay. So even if it makes like a bell curve, but the mode is like two in like the 150 percent yeah. it wouldn't ever be that because mode is most often and the bell curve represents what's the most often how many people right the median is the middle mode is how many how many people the height is on this axis would be how many people represent this on this axis would be what you're measuring so maybe you're measuring height how many you know really short people do you know not very many and as you get to the mean and this is why one thing they say in the study of genetics, even if you have really two really tall people, their baby, everything tends to the mean in society. Tending, you know, in genetics, it also kind of uh, tends to the mean. So, um, it only has one mode. Um, it's metric about the mean, which is equivalent to saying. The shape is the same on both sides, the vertical line passing through the center. This is very important because we can't apply that normal distribution without this. Because if I have a Z value over here, it also represents the same negative Z value as far as area on our table. So it has to be symmetric. It's continuous. Um, that's more the calculus type thing. You can't integrate it. You can't find the area if it's not continuous. Um, the area under the proportion of a normal curve is a percentage in decimal form of the data that falls between the data values that begin and end in that region. So if I say something like this is 0.38, as far as my A table, would tell me that would say 38% of the data falls within this region. Um, the total area under the curve is exactly one which has to make sense because 100% of the data has to fall with under, with it, under the curve. So it's kind of like 100%. So you can think of it as percentage is of the um, sample space. So based on property six, the area under the whole curve encompasses all data values. 
So 100% of the data values. Here's the empirical rule, and this is something you'll memorize. One standard deviation is 68% of the data. So 68% of the data falls between one standard deviation. Two standard deviations would be 95% of the data. Three standard deviations is 99. This book does 27. It's an approximate, so it's good enough to guess. It's a rough estimate. 68, 95, 97.3, that's the empirical rule. So if your data point falls on exactly a standard deviation, you can use this table to say, so one standard deviation is above and below. So this is saying 68% of the data falls one standard deviation from the mean. So one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. If you only want one standard deviation above, it's half of it, right? Because it's symmetric about the or, or it's symmetric about the mean. So one standard deviation would represent a z value of one, right? So if you go to that chart, see if I can pull it up. You will have the chart that's in your book, this chart right here on the test. This will be your last page. It will just be the whole page. That's just numbers. And then if we look at a z-score of 1, see if I find it here, the z-score of 1, you can see the area is... 0.341, which corresponds to 0.341, 1 would correspond to the area of 34.1%. And if we go to the PowerPoint, we can see that's exactly what that's showing. Half of 68% is 34.1, roughly. You can just go 34 percent. You only have to remember 68.95, So if it falls exactly on it, you don't even need the chart. You can memorize the empirical rule, but it's not always going to fall on exactly one standard deviation or two standard deviations or three standard deviations. Um, let's look at the first example here. According to a website, answerbags.com, the mean height for a male human is 5 feet, 9.3 inches, with a standard deviation of 2.8 inches. If this is accurate, out of 1,000 randomly selected men, how many would expect to be between 5 feet, 6.5 inches, and 6 feet, 0.1 inch? So what this is saying is this is a normal distribution. The average or the mean is 5 feet 9.3 inches with a standard deviation of 2.6 inches. So we don't have to convert this to z-scores here. So if I was to add one standard deviation above What's 5 feet, 9.3 inches, plus 2.8 inches? So we need to convert it to inches. You can. You can keep it in feet inches. Um, probably would be easier to convert it all into inches, since then that would just be easiest to add. However, this is not in inches, so then you'd have to convert back. So you can leave it in feet and inches. So if I was to add 5 feet, 9.3 inches, plus 2.8 inches, so this would give me 12, which 12 inches, 1 foot. So this would be 6 feet and 1 inch, which is what I kind of expected because I haven't learned z-score yet. So this is one standard deviation above. Twelve. Twelve point one, but twelve inches is a foot, so I round up by feet. 
to six feet one inch or sorry six feet point one inch right so now i can also check the same below so one standard deviation below would be five feet 9.3 inches minus 2.8 inches this would be this would be five feet 6.5 inches right which is exactly one standard deviation <coughs> So using the empirical rule, what percentage of the data is going to fall between 5 feet, 6.5 inches, and 6 feet, 0.1 inch? 68% because I know that number. That's the empirical rule, 68% of the data. If I have 1,000 data points, how many would I expect to fall between that range? Six hundred and eighty, right? So the number here would be six hundred and eighty um, men. So, because the empirical rule tells me one standard deviation is sixty-eight percent, two standard deviation is ninety-five. Yes. So I'm looking. I'm looking for this total area. From this corresponds to minus one, right? One standard deviation below. And this corresponds to positive one, one standard deviation above. Eventually, we're going to find the normal standard distribution. Normal standard distribution shifts this, and so this is zero, so this would correspond to one. But it, for the data point, you have a data point of six foot point one inches. That corresponds to a z score of plus one, because that's one standard deviation. So a lot of times, you'll write both the z score and the data point for the interesting information on your, your curve. Is that 680 men? 680 men is about 68% of 1,000. If I had 5,000 men, I would take 68% of 5,000. I had 10,000 men, so forth. So I'm expecting 680 of them to fall within that range out of the 1,000. That's not exact. It's an approximation, yeah. Of course, it can be off a little just because. But this is what we're trying to kind of comprehend. That's like if you're an engineer, you're building something, you have to know, you have to maybe build it where you're expecting 99.7% of the population to be able to ride the roller coaster or whatever. So you have to make sure you have the parameters in order so that happens. All right. So this is just pretty, um, you don't actually have to write any of the things I did here. You could know that it's one standard deviation and then know 68% of the population will fall within one standard deviation. Take that times 1,000 and get 680, but these are going to get more complicated where it's not exact. It's the process. Yeah. Question. Okay. So Five feet, nine point three inches. Is that the mean? Five feet, nine point three inches is the mean, the median, and the mode. Okay. So even if they, if, even if they told us this is the mode of the height of male humans, we yeah. all know that that's still the mean. Yeah. yeah still you happens. cannot do anything unless it's a normal distribution, okay. and it's only a normal distribution if the mean, the median, and the mode are equal. Okay. Question. Okay. I'm really confused. How do you like? I, I understand how you did the math and stuff, but yeah. how did you know that it was one standard deviation? Okay, so I was given the mean and I was given the standard deviation. If I take the mean plus the standard deviation and the mean minus the standard deviation, I get these two numbers. Okay. So that range is one standard deviation. So 5 feet, 9.8 inches plus 2.8, mm -hmm. and then 5. 
minus 2.8 inches gives you 5 feet 6.8 inches and 6 feet 0.1 inch. That would be the range of one standard deviation. If I add 2.8 inches again, I get the range for two standard deviations. Oh, okay. And 95% so just... of the population will fall with that range. So you would, gotcha. you would if you add it again, you would skip add it to those two bottom numbers? Yes. yes. So it's just because you just added it and subtracted it once? Yes. That gotcha. gave me one okay. standard That makes sense now. Yeah. If I did it twice, I get two. And if I get it three times, and then I correspond the empirical rule. And that is only going to be when it falls exactly at a standard deviation. But if it falls above or below one standard deviation, we have to go to the Z score, which we're getting to. Which we're getting okay. to. <laughs> but here's the thing about it: you can convert all these to Z scores and just look at the table. Okay. So it's kind of a nice reassurance. This book doesn't tell you the formula to calculate Z score directly, but I'll give it to you. Yeah. It, it it should make sense. Um, the easier, do you think? We need the easier route. Only the easier route. <laughs> it's, it's two things. I didn't have to look at the table at all. And I know the answer was 680. Because I'm comfortable with the empirical rule, I know one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. If I wanted to confirm and make sure, I could go to the Z scores. I could go to that table. Let's see. And look at the table. And this table would tell me, I could calculate my Z score, which in this case would be one. And that would tell me 0.341% of the data falls with that range. However, in the z-score, it only tells me half the story. So I'd have to double it, which would give me 68%, 68%, which would be the exact same process. One of them, I apply the table. The other one, I just know the empirical rule. And you can only know the empirical rule for one, two, and three standard deviations. Only for that. Only for that. So There's nothing else to... So what answer is really one of there? 68% or 680? Six, because it asks how many men are going to fall within that range mm -hmm. so out of the 1,000 I picked. If I would have said I, I picked 5,000, your answer would be 68% of 5,000. Hmm. If I said I had five, we'd have 68% of five. So if this kind of question is on test, which probably will be, yes. If I put sixty-eight percent, that would be wrong. Because you you would miss a couple points because you didn't answer the question. The question asked, how many would you expect to fall between? And I could be somewhat flexible at that, but since it said out of one thousand, one thousand, sixty-eight percent of one thousand would be correct. Sixty-eight percent of five thousand, if if it said five thousand. Okay. So the, if you look at the answer in the back of the book, it might be something different than what you get, but you're just one step away from that. Okay. okay. So the next thing to do to get the z-score is we're going to look at the data and we're going to normalize it, standard normal distribution. And a standard normal distribution is the exact same thing as kind of what we had, except we have zero to the mean. So how far away from the mean we're going to have plus one, plus two, and plus three. We're not going to get much over plus three because 99.7% of the data falls within minus three to three. We don't care about that. So, yeah, so it's going to be so small. I mean, there, there is some, but it's just so small. Your table even actually only goes up to minus, maybe it goes almost to four. Z score. So, here's the formula for the Z score. And this should make sense. You take how far away you are from the mean divided by the standard deviation. So if you're one standard deviation away from the mean, you divide that by the standard deviation, you get one, right? You're two standard deviations from the mean, then you have two times the standard deviation divided by standard deviation, you get two. So you can always calculate this z-score to be, and it's very important you do this order, because it's important if you're above the mean or below the mean, if your z is positive or if your z is negative. Right. The reason why this is going to come up, so let's say we have a z, a z score here of minus, say minus, 1.3 is our z-score. If we look in the table, that's going to give us this area. But we need to 
find both sides? Just depends on the setup. If it says from minus 1.3 to 0, you already have it. The area is always going to be positive. If it says minus 1.3 to 1.3, you have to multiply it by, you have to add them both together or multiply it by 2 in a sense. But sometimes I might want to know what percent of the population falls below. So you would just subtract that part out. You would, you would know that this is 0.5% of the population or 50% of the population. So the area is 0.5 and you would have to subtract A. I might want to know what percent of the population falls above that line. I want I might want to know in this way shading in the area is very beneficial. I might want to know what percent of the population is above it. So I can find this A and then know this is 0.5 and I would add 0.5 to A. You could say what percent of the population falls without outside that range. You would find the area of the range and take one minus your answer, one minus the area of the range, and you would get your answer. So some of these properties you're going to use depending on your curve. And you can get partial credit here by drawing a curve. You don't have to necessarily, but if you draw a curve and you shade in the right area, but you make the wrong conclusion from the table, I can give you some partial credit there. Because, you're because I can see you understand what it's, it's asking. You're getting... But I can't necessarily see what you're interpreting from the table. But I can see that if you would have interpreted it correctly, you would have got the right answer. So this is the exact same example, but we're going to use z-score here. Um, we want to find the z-score for a man who's 6 feet 4 inches. So do you remember the mean in example 1? 5 foot 9.3 inches, right? Um, it, it could in inches. Um, yeah, so the z score, since we're dividing top and bottom by the same number, you, you'd have to put it all in feet or all in inches because you can't divide it because it's mixed number in that sense. So you could take it, um, what do we say? This would be 5 times 12 plus 9.3 inches. And then we want to know the z-score for someone that is 6 feet 4 inches. So 6 times 12 plus 4, which would give me inches. So my z-score is going to be 76 minus... 69.3 divided by my standard deviation, which is 2.8 inches. So I have to be inches divided by inches or feet divided by feet to get that to cancel. And you're just going to get a number here. What do we get? 2.39. 2.39. This would be my z-score. I would expect it to be positive because... He is taller than me, so it's going to be on the right side of the middle. So if you know if you get it, if, if yes. it doesn't look right. And there's, yeah, and there's really, this, a multiple step problem is kind of where you're true. If you get this to be negative, there's no negative Z. So it's going to correspond to the same positive Z, so you can get the same area once we apply it. But where, we, where you would screw up if I say less than or equal to. If I said if it was less than or equal to and you put it on the left hand side, you're going to take 0.5 minus A. But if it was over here, you would take 0.5 plus A. Okay. So that's where it makes sense. That's where you have to be really careful when it says less than or equal to a D value or a certain height. Uh, yeah, so if you look at your Z table, or if you look at your table, does it give you two decimals or three? Three. Three. So 2.39 would be more accurate than 2.4, right, for your Z. So now it's not asking you to apply it in this case. It's asking you to um, just calculate the Z score. Actually, it's this Z. Okay, so it's only one, it's only two decimals for Z. Three is for the area. So two decimals for the Z, so we would have to round this to 
And let's go to, yeah. Yeah. So here they're not asking us to apply it anywhere. It just wants to know where it is. But they could say what percent of the population is shorter than this man. They didn't, but I'm saying that's where we're going to. So this, this doesn't mean anything, 2.4, unless we can apply it. And we can apply it to say what percent of the population is short of this. Maybe you're going to build a, um, a roller coaster and you want 95% of the population to be able to ride it. And you have to be, or you can't be taller than six feet, four inches to ride it. Will 95% of the population be able to ride it? That's kind of where we're, we're leading to. So if we have this normal distribution, we have the Z score of 2.4 which gives us an area of what? 34.1. Whoa. It has to be, it's less than 0. 0.5. It's 0.492. Let's go to the Z table. We're looking for the Z corresponding to 2.4. So we're looking at the Z's, not the A's. 2.4. Right there. Right there. 2.4 right here. So this tells me the area is 0.492. 0 0.492. 0 the area that it gives you is only the area from 0 to Z. So if I want to know what percent of the population is less than this person's height, I would have to also add this 0.5 into it. So this would be 0.992, which makes, so 99.2% of the population is shorter than this person. That's how it begins to get four. Huh? Because that was like six four, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and six four. feet, four inches. So that makes sense. Yeah, and then the point 0.5 represents the other complete. The point 0.5, yeah, represents this other point, this other map here. Then we could also say 0.008% of the population is taller. Okay. Right? The area here would be 0 0.008, which would correspond to 8% or 0.8%. Okay. Right? So it just depends on how they word what they want, how you apply the z-score. The z-score doesn't really give you anything except being able to look at the table and define the area, the area between zero and Z. So Z score then gives you area. Is there an example like that? Yeah, so let's, we'll do many of them. Okay. Do you want, and also do you want us to keep it, like the area, do you want it in percentage or do you want it in decimal form? It, it, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. If, okay. if, if you said, one half equals 0.5 equals 50 percent. These are all equivalent answers. Yeah. Now, the the only time you actually apply it, if I say out of 5,000 people, okay, then you would tell me how many people met that criteria. But really, that's just one extra step there. Um, the normal distribution facts here. I've kind of hit this a couple times, but. To the left of the mean and to the right of the mean are both 0.5 because it's um, symmetric. And you, the z value, the area is always between 0 and z. And since it's symmetric, it's also between 0 and minus z. So let's look at actually applying this. Number one, it's kind of jumping to say maybe you've already calculated the z z is easy to calculate you take your x point minus your mean over your standard deviation so if i give you your data point maybe your height minus the average height of a woman divided by the standard deviation i would give you all that and you would get a corresponding z so once you have the corresponding z these three examples are areas between Find the area under the standard norm of four between, so for A, if I draw my picture here, 
I have 1.55 and 2.25. If I want this area, how would I go about finding the area between 1.55 and 2.25? I would subtract them, right? I would take the Z is 2.25. I would find the corresponding A. And for Z being 1.55, I'd find the corresponding A. Let's call this A 2.25 and call this A 1.55. And I would take A 2.25 minus A 1.55, right? Because this first A value is going to give me the area between 0 and this A here. The second A value is going to give me the area, this yellow area. So if I take the purple minus the yellow, I get the red. Here I have to subtract them. If one was positive and one was negative, you actually add them. If they're both negative, you take the larger one minus the smaller. Right? If they're on the both the same side, or here. If I'm on the same side and I want the area between them, you always take the larger one minus the smaller one. But if one's positive and one's negative, you're going to take the area here plus the area here. So on the between, there's only going to be three things that happen. They're both positive, they're both negative, one's positive, one's negative. So you either add them or sub the larger, you take the larger area minus the smaller area. So two positive minus... If they're two positive, you're... Two negatives you're going to subtract as well because they're on the both they're both negative they're on the same side if they're on the same side of the, the mean you're going to subtract the larger area from the smaller area so then on the, the last one you're going to add and the last one you're going to add because one's positive and one's negative okay. so drawing pictures are, are helpful here because you can see what's being shaded am i going to add am i going to subtract Looking at the table, I get the two Z scores. One's 0.439, the other's 0.488. So if I take the larger one minus the smaller one, you will never have a negative area. Okay. Throw that out there right now. If you have a negative area, you know you did something wrong. Area can never be negative. So it turns out 4.9% of the population falls within this area. So if this would correspond to mean something, maybe height of a person, you would know what percent would fall within that area, which would be some range. The Z values don't tell you anything, but the corresponding data point would. So you guys try to do the second one. Is the area not? Uh, the area is 0 0.049. So you're, you're subtracting the Z's. You have to subtract the corresponding A. You have to convert it to A. So you have to go to that table. The Z value just tells you where they fall on the curve. What's the corresponding area? You have to go to the table. Table and look 0 yeah, so I went to the table and I saw with a Z of 1.55, that would tell me my area is 0.439. So 1.55, so this area here is 0.439 from the table. Okay. This, I thought that was a highlighter. This area corresponds, this Z value corresponds to this A. This Z corresponds to this A. To find the shaded region, I think the larger A minus the smaller A to get the shaded part. A will always be positive. Right? A will always be positive. Because A is area, which corresponds to a percent of the population that falls within a range. <laughs> So let's look at number, or part B. Part B, we have both sides of the negative. 
So I have to look at the D4 for minus 1.35 and the D4 for minus 0.6. The minus tells you it's to the left. The Z is always going to be positive on your table because it's evenly distributed. So it doesn't matter if it's on the right or the left. The Z would just tell you it's below it. Do you, do you want us to convert it back in? No, you want to keep it. Here's just wants to know the area, so a decimal is fine. There's no 1,000 people polled or, or 1,000 people randomly selected. And you want us to keep it as A squared? Right? A, yeah, which corresponds to percentage. Okay. But if you write it as a percent, that's fine. So looking at the table for my two Z values, I get my area for my two areas. To find the shaded area, take the larger area minus the smaller area. So the Z values were given, right? Mm -hmm. If I graph it, or if I, I know they're both on the left. So I know I need to find the two corresponding areas and then take the larger one minus the smaller one to find the shaded region. And so doing that, we get 0 0.186. So 18.6% of the population falls within this range. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be able to get those A values from the table, depending on their, if they're both to the right or both to the left, you're going to take the larger one minus the smaller one. If one's on one side and one's on the other, like part C, drawing the picture, you can see I'm going to find the Z, the Z table, I'm going to find the area that corresponds to this, the Z table of 1.5, find the corresponding area. If I want the shaded region, I add the two areas together because they're on opposite sides. If it's opposite sides, you add them, yes. Depending on the setup, it wanted to know between. Yeah, right? It could, this could be a multi part problem if I say, you know, what per percent of the population falls with outside this range? You'd find the inside range and then take one minus that. Right? Because this whole thing is going to add up to one. There's going to be multiple ways to present it. Right now, we're only looking at between. Between two Z values, you're either going to take the larger one minus the smaller one, or you're going to add them. On the back. And then on the back. Right. Yes. And then, and then next time, we'll do to the right or to the left. So if I give you one Z value, so this is like saying what percent of the population is greater than or less than. If I give you one Z value here, and I want to know to the left of it, you're going to calculate A and add 0.5, right? If you want to know everything to the right, you're going to take 0.5 minus A, because A would be this, this shaded region is A. Mm -hmm. And if I want to know everything to the right, I know everything to the right of zero is 0 0.5. So if I take 0.5 minus the A that corresponds to your Z, you get your answer there. To the right or to the left. So it's not too bad. And there's actually some really interesting applications. So then you can actually apply it to data or what it means. Yeah. So if you look at um, you know, the normal standard distribution and say, you know, what percent of the population falls within this range, you can calculate it this way. All right, guys, have a nice weekend. Monday, we'll hit this again. Wednesday, I'll give you guys your free test. Friday, we won't have class next week. Come back from free break, review the pre test, and then take the free chapter break. 12 Easter break. Not even a break, but Easter. Take us on Wednesday, start chapter 10 on Friday. Our last chapter.
How is it? Chapter 10? Yeah. Have a good weekend. You too. Um, it's on like geometry, um, oh. area. Oh, that's um, A little bit of trig. How is it comparable to the other chapters? Depends on 